these notes are over 9.1 radicals and quadratics. The essential question says, how can I simplify radical expressions and solve quadratic equations? These are both two concepts that you should have learned in Algebra 1, but we will review them um, so that you will be successful in Chapter 9. So the first thing we're going to review is simplifying radical expressions. And a radical expression is any expression that has a square root symbol. The opposite of taking the square root of a number is squaring the number. Remember that taking the square root of a number is trying to figure out what number times itself equals the number underneath the square root symbol. Um, there's several ways that you can do this. I'm going to show you my favorite way, which I call the upside down division. Some people call it upside down cake but it involves factors of the number you're taking the square root of that are prime numbers. So the first thing you, we need to do is make sure that we know some of our prime numbers. And you don't need to know all the prime numbers, which you could not know because they go on infinitely. But the very smallest prime number is 2, then 3, then 5, then 7, then 11, then 13, and we could keep going and going, 17, 19, 23, um, 29. However, if you learn this method, you usually won't have to use any prime numbers beyond these first six. Um, most numbers can definitely be divisible by 2, 3, or 5, so I always start with one of those. So this part is important, so make sure you've got these written down so you can refer to these. Remember, a prime number is a number that can only be divided evenly by one and itself. So I'm just going to jump right in and kind of show you, and after we do a few of these, hopefully you'll get the hang of it. Remember, if you have any questions, put a little note off to the side in the left margin, and we can go over it in class. So first thing we're going to do is simplify the square root of 216. Now, you could type this in your calculator, but it's going to give you a decimal equivalent, which is not an exact answer. So if we ever say we want the exact answer, we want you to simplify it in one of the methods that I'm about to show you. So this is how the upside down division works. You write the number you're taking the square root of, 216. And then instead of doing like a normal long division symbol, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it underneath the number. I'm going to look at my prime numbers, and I usually start with 2 or 3, because if it's an even number, it can be divisible by 2. Um, but it really doesn't matter what numbers you start with. It just matters what numbers you end with. What we're about to do is very sim similar to a prime factorization tree, which many of you did in junior high, if you remember. It has all the little branches of all the little prime factors. So it's basically what we're doing, but it just takes up a little less work. Because this is an even number, I'm going to start with 2, because that's very easy to divide something by 2. You're just going to put it out to the left, and you're going to divide it into the number. Um, Whatever's left goes underneath. So 2 will go into 216 108 times. Since 108 is not a prime number, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to do my upside down division symbol again. I'm going to look over at my prime numbers list and pick another number. If I can stick with 2, I might as well. 2 will again go into this new number because it's also even. 2 goes into 108 54 times. 54 is not prime, so I'm going to do another upside down division symbol. I'm going to look at my prime numbers again. I can still use 2 because 54 is also even. 2 goes into 54 27 times. 27 is not prime. So I'm going to do my upside down division symbol. Um, 2 will not go into 27, so I'm going to look for a different prime number. Usually if 2 doesn't work, many times 3 or 5 or 7 will work. So I know that 27 is divisible by 3, so I'm going to use that. 3 goes into 27 9 times. Sometimes students think 9 is a prime number, but remember it's divisible by 3. So I'm going to keep going. 3 is the only prime number that will go into 9, and it goes in 3 times. Now notice my bottom number is one of the prime numbers that we have up here. Once it's prime, that's when you stop. Okay. So that's the first part. What you're going to end up with is a bunch of numbers out to the left and one number on the bottom. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to pair up numbers. So I've got three twos and three threes. Um, I can make one pair of twos, and I can make one pair of threes. Notice I have a two and a three left over. I'll tell you what to do with those in a minute. 
the ones that we circled, this pair of twos we're going to count as one, two. This pair of threes we're going to count as one, three. And we're going to put these numbers outside of our square root symbol. But we're not going to put them next to each other. We're going to actually multiply them together to make six. And then that number goes on the outside. Okay. Now the numbers that we did not circle that don't have a pair, they're kind of like alone, um, are this two and three. We're going to multiply them. If there was just one, you would just not multiply it by anything. But since there are two of them, we're going to multiply them together. That also gives me six. This six is going to go inside. And so the square root of 216 simplifies to 6 square root of 6. This is the simple, simplified version of square root of 216. I'm trying to write over it because that red is probably hard to see. So let's try another one of these so you can kind of get the hang of it. Um, square root of 720, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to put, we're going to write 720. We're going to do our upside down division symbol. Since it's even, I might as well start with 2. 720 is divisible by 2. It goes in 360 times. And this is a number we're familiar working with. Um, we know that this number could also be divisible by 2. But let's just say at this point you had used 5 or 3 instead of 2. You may use different numbers in a different order than your neighbor, but at the end you're going to end up with the same numbers on the outside. So it's really okay what kind of, what number you choose to use each time. I'm just going to stick with 2 though because it's easy. 2 goes into 360 180 times. Okay, let's go again. I can keep using 2. 2 goes into 180 90 times. 90 is still even, so I could divide it by 2. 2 goes into 90 45 times. Now 45 is not even. So I need to choose a different number. I'm going to just kind of go in order because I think that's easiest. I'm going to pick the 3. Um, if you go in order, also it will keep all of your pairs next to each other, which is another advantage if you want to make it easier on yourself. 3 will go into 45 15 times. 3 will go into 15 5 times. Now since 5 is prime, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to pick a color not red because that was hard to see last time. So now I'm going to look at these outside numbers and we're going to pair up any pairs that we have. I'm going to circle them. I've got a pair of twos, I've got another pair of twos, and I've got a pair of threes. So remember, I'm going to count each one of these one time each. So I've got one, two, another two, and a three. The ones that you pair up, remember, count them once, then multiply them together if there's more than one and you're going to put that number outside your symbol. So 2 times 2 times 3 is 12. So that goes out here. You may want to write yourself a little note. 2 times 2 times 3. Now this 5 that's left over, anything left over always stays inside. And a way somebody said you can remember this, you can think of it as um, the square root symbol is the house, and you don't want anybody to leave the house by themselves if it's not safe outside, so you have to have a pair to leave, and that was a kind of a good way to remember it. Now let me just show you, I'm going to go off to the side. Um, so the square root of 720 simplifies to 12 squared of 5. Now last year many of you learned this using perfect square factors. So just kind of off to the side, let me show you what that might look like. Let me get the yellow again. So what you could do, you could start off with, you know, square root of 720. And now I'm going to break that down into its factors that are perfect squares. So I know, I know 36 is a perfect square because 6 times 6 is 36. And I know that will go into 720. And I know it will go in 20 times. So I could say square root of 720 is the same as square root of 36 times 20. I could even break those down even more. Um, since 20 is not a perfect square, I know it has a perfect square factor, so I could even say this is the same as square root of 36 times 4 times 5. 4 is a perfect square, 36 is a perfect square. 
Anything that's a perfect square inside my radical, I can take the square root of and bring out in front. So the square root of 36 would be 6. The square root of 4 is 2. I'm going to have those two numbers out front, multiply them together, and then I'm going to leave that 5 inside because it's not a perfect square. Multiply the 6 and 2 together, and we're still going to get 12 squared of 5. Now there's nothing wrong with this method at all. Um, what you're going to find though is you really need to have a good grasp of what your perfect squares are. So the method on the right involves a little more thinking, but the method on the left may require a little more work, but you can kind of do it without even thinking once you do it enough. Um, I like the method on the left myself, but it's kind of up to you what you prefer. Okay, let's try square root of 54. So if we, um, you know, always start with the simplest, since it's even, is the 2. 2 will go into 54. Oh, we did that a minute ago, 27. And then 27 is not divisible by 2, but I know 3 is. 3 will go into 27 9 times. 9 is not prime, so I want to keep going, put my symbol. 3 will go into 9, so I'm going to put 3 out to the side. 3 goes into 9 3 times. Now here, I'm going to point out something right now that some students do, and it kind of tricks them. Some students will immediately always put this little upside down division symbol. And then when they realize, oh, 3 is prime, I'm done, that's great. But then they will ignore the 3 when they're doing their pairs. So just to kind of get out of the habit of that, once your bottom number is prime, just stop. Don't do a division symbol, okay? All right, so I've got my four numbers out to the side. I don't have a pair of twos, but I do have a pair of threes. Remember, count that one time. Now, I don't have another pair to multiply it with, so I'm just going to put that number on the outside. The two and the three that are left, I'm going to multiply those to make six, and that's going to go on the inside. So three squared of six is the simplified version of 54. Okay, so sometimes your expressions that you need to simplify involve more than just simplifying a radical. Sometimes they involve you to multiply radicals, add, divide. So we're going to do a couple of those now. Um, so here's the rule when you're multiplying radicals. Just write this off to the side. You're going to multiply outside, the outside number, with the outside number. and inside the inside number, the number inside the radical with the inside number. Okay, never multiply an outside number with an inside number because they're different. One is in the radical and one is not, so they're, they can't be multiplied together. So this is kind of how it works. The two and the four are both outside numbers, so I'm gonna multiply those together to get eight. Now I'm ready for my inside number. I'm going to multiply my two inside numbers, which are 3 and 15, which is going to give me 45. So that's how I multiply them together. But now I have to look at what I've got, and I have to simplify that the way we did a few minutes ago. So I'm just going to look at the radical part. So I'm going to go off to the side. Under the radical is 45. So I'm going to think of my prime numbers. It's not even, so 2 won't work. I'm going to try 3. Or I could choose 5. Either one is great to start with. 3 will go into 45 15 times. I'm going to choose 3 again. 3 goes into 15 5 times. 5 is prime. I'm going to stop. Now I'm going to circle my pairs. I only have one pair of 3's. Remember it counts as one 3. That 3 is going to go on the outside. And then the 5 that's left over will go on the inside. But remember, we also have this 8 in front of the square root of 45. Outside numbers, remember, can always multiply with other outside numbers. So we're going to multiply the 8 with the 3 to get 24. And then we're just going to tack on the square root of 5 at the end. And this is the simplified version of that product. All right, sometimes when you're simplifying an expression, um, there's a quotient, which means you have two things being divided. So here's the rule. 
There's nothing wrong with a fraction, I've told you many times. However, if there is a radical in the denominator, we have to get rid of it. So write this down. Cannot have radical in denominator. And so what you have to do, and I'm going to show you how this works, is you have to do something called rationalize the denominator. Rationalize the denominator. So the way that we rationalize the denominator is we take the square root that's in the denominator and we multiply it by the top and by the bottom of the fraction. And the reason why we're able to do this is because anything over itself always equals 1. And we can multiply anything by 1 without changing the value. Now it may change the way it looks, but it's not going to change the value of that fraction. Remember how to multiply fractions? You multiply straight across. So we're going to multiply in the top 5 times square root of 3. And since 5 is outside and 3 is inside, the numerator is just going to simplify to 5 squared of 3, okay? In the denominator, we have square root of 3 times square root of 3. So remember, you can multiply the two 3's because they're both inside, and that gives you square root of 9. Well, 9 is a perfect square. I can take the square root of 9. I know that it's 3. So what happens is... Our numerator stays 5 squared to 3, but our denominator changes to 3. Now, this step up here, you can kind of skip this whole step and just go straight from this times this to 3. Because what happens is when you multiply a radical by itself, it turns into a whole number. Basically, the radical goes away. So 5 squared of 3 over 3 is a simplified version of 5 over squared of 3. It's the rationalized version. This is considered proper, and the other one is not. It's not proper. So we always want to simplify things the right way. This seems silly, but I promise you'll get used to it. Okay, so this is an example of adding or combining radical expressions. Now, when you combine radical expressions, it's kind of the same thing as when you're combining like terms. They have to be like. And for radical expressions to be like, they have to have the same number under the radical symbol. Well, all of these numbers are different. 18, 32, and 74, they're all different. So what we have to do first is see if we can simplify each of these individually. And sometimes when you do that, then some of them will actually end up with the same number under the radical, and they'll actually be like, and then we can combine them. So let's start off with the 18. So I'm just going to kind of do these off to the side. Um, a prime number that will go into 18, 2 will work. Goes in 9. 3 will go into 9. 3, I'm done. I've got a pair of 3s. Count that as 1, 3. That 3 is going to go on the outside of my square root symbol. The 2 that's left over will go inside. So there's that guy simplified. I'm going to kind of separate these so we don't get confused. Okay, the next, the next one we want to do is the square root of 32. So I'm going to do my upside down division again. 2 will go into 32 16 times. I can use 2 again. 2 goes into 16 8 times. 2 goes into 8 4 times. I can use 2 again. 2 goes into 4 2 times. 2 is prime, so I'm done. I'm going to circle my pairs. I've got a pair of 2's here, a pair of 2's here, and a 2 left over. I'm going to count each of these pairs as 1 2. Since I have 2 pairs, I've got 2 2's. I'm going to multiply those together, and I'm going to get 4 on the outside. The 2 that doesn't have a pair it has to stay on the inside can't leave the house by himself. I'm going to do the same thing with the 75. I'm just going to separate this. OK, 
Okay, so 2 will not go into 75, so I can try the 3 or the 5. I know 3 goes into 75 because I'm thinking of quarters. goes in 25 times. Now I can use a 5. 5 will go into 25 5 times. 5 is prime, so I'm done. I have a pair of 5s, and I have a 3 left over. Remember, I'm going to count this pair as 1 5. That 5 goes on the outside. The leftover 3 goes inside. So now we have simplified all three expressions. Now we can look at the numbers under the radical. I've got these two guys, the first two terms both have a 2 under the radical, so those are like. The last term is not like, the one with the 3. It will, you could kind of think of this as like 3x plus 4x plus 5y. I could add the 3x and the 4x together, but the 5y I would have to leave off to the side. So, to simplify this, what you do, the ones that are like, the ones that both have square root of 2, I'm not going to touch the square root of 2. Okay, just like if I was adding 3x and 4x, I'd get 7x. I would just add the 3 and the 4. I'm just going to add the numbers in the front, which is going to make 7. So 3 squared to 2 plus 4 squared to 2 is 7 squared to 2, plus this 5 squared to 3 at the end that's not like. So this expression is the simplified version of the three terms we were trying to add at the beginning. So the first part of the notes was simplifying radical expressions. The second part is solving quadratic equations. A quadratic equation is any type of equation that has an x squared as the highest power. Um, so there's different types of quadratic equations. We're going to look at a few. Um, for this type, notice how I only have an x squared term. I don't have an x term. I have an x squared term, and then I have two constants. So write this little note off to the side. When you have an x squared term only, meaning no x term, you're going to set it equal to the constant, Oops. and by constant I just mean the, the number, and take the square root of both sides. So when you have this case, um, those of you who don't like to factor, you don't have to factor. Kind of cool. Okay, so let's let's try that. Um, I'm going to get the x squared term by itself, everything else on the other side. So the first thing I'm going to do is subtract 9 from both sides. x squared equals 16. Okay, just like I said, now what we're going to do is take the square root of both sides. When I take the square root of something squared, the square root symbol and the square, they undo each other. So these two things kind of go away, and I'm left with just x, right? We learned last chapter, though, when I take the square root of something in an equation and I'm solving, there's always two values. So the square root of 16, I know, is not only 4, because 4 times 4 is 16, but it's also negative 4, because negative 4 times negative 4 is 16. So I can write down both of those solutions with this symbol in front of the 4, plus and minus 4. So these are my two solutions. Remember when you solve quadratics, many times you'll have two solutions. Sometimes you'll have no solutions, and sometimes you'll have one solution. Okay, here's an application question. Find x. Now many of you might remember from junior high that we can find the missing side in a right triangle by using Pythagorean theorem, a squared, plus b squared equals c squared. Um, and the, a big part of this chapter is right triangles. Actually, the majority of it is, so you definitely need to know this. Um, when you are applying your a, b, and your c to your triangle, c is always the long side that's across from your right angle, and a and b are the other two sides. I'm going to call this a and this b. You could switch them and still get the same answer. Okay, now we're going to plug them in. Now, 
Um, what's different about this time that we're using Pythagorean theorem is that you've probably never done it with radicals. So we're going to see how that works. When I put these radicals into my formula and I need to square them, I must put them in parentheses. So when I put 3 squared to 2 in place of a, oops, I need to write it like this, 3 squared to 2 in parentheses squared for my b, which is 3 squared to 5. Again, I want to put 3 squared to 5 in parentheses squared, and then my c is just my x. So this is what I have to solve for. Um, when you square something, I want you to remember what that means. It means that thing times itself. So 3 squared to 2 squared is the same as 3 squared to 2 times 3 squared to 2 plus 3 squared to 5 squared is the same as 3 squared to 5 times 3 squared to 5, and that equals x squared. So now we're going to use the rules that we just learned about multiplying radicals and adding. Um, when I multiply radicals, I can multiply outside with outside and inside with inside. Outside with outside, inside with inside. So let's see what happens. On the first one, 3 times 3 is 9 on the outside. I have 2 times 2, which is 4 on the inside. For my next product, my two outside numbers are 3. 3 times 3 is 9. My two inside numbers are 5, so 5 times 5 is 25. Now, some of y'all probably already noticed, um, and we did this a minute ago, when I square a radical, it gets rid of the radical symbol. So square to 2 times square to 2, yeah, it's square to 4, but square to 4 is 2. So this is really just 9 times 2. And over here, this is really 9 times 5, because the square root of 25 is 5. So if you want to skip that whole step above this one I just did, you can, once you get used to doing this a lot. All right, let's simplify. 9 times 2 is 18. 9 times 5 is 45. Okay, now I want to add these together. They're just normal numbers. So what is that? 63. Now we have something like we had a few minutes ago. You're going to take the square root of both sides. Square root of x squared is just going to be x. Now remember, I'm going to have a plus and minus as my answer. But 63, i got to see if I can simplify. I know 63 is not a perfect square. 64 is, but not 63. So we're going to go off to the side and see if we can simplify it. Um, 3 will go in... 21 times. I can use 3 as a prime factor. Again, 3 goes into 21 7 times. Okay, 7's prime, so I'm stopping. I've got a pair of 3's, which counts as 1 3. That 3 goes on the outside. The 7 that's left over goes on the inside. And I need to make sure to put a plus or minus in front. So these are my two solutions positive 3 times square root of 7 and negative 3 times square root of 7. Now, if you look at what x actually represents, because it's a length, the only answer that actually makes sense with this problem is the positive version. So the actual value of x in this particular situation is going to be the positive 3 squared of 7. So this is the answer that I really want to put. But there are two solutions. If, if a picture wasn't attached to this, there would definitely be two solutions. Here's an example of solving a quadratic when you have not only the x squared term, but also the x term. This is more what you're used to. Write yourself this note off to the side if you need to remember. So when you have an x squared and x terms, I guess I don't really need and there, right? Then you're going to set all of it, everything, equal to zero, and then factor. Okay, 
So let's try this. So to get everything onto one side, we're going, it's probably easiest to move that negative 16 over by adding it to both sides. So I'm going to end up with 0 on the right, but on the left I've got three terms that are all unlike. So I'm just going to list them in descending order of exponent. Now on the left I've got a quadratic trinomial. Trinomial means we have three terms and that usually always simplifies pretty easily into two binomials. Because the coefficient of my x squared term is a 1, there's an imaginary 1 there, an invisible 1, I get to put x and x here. I'm going to look at my 16 and I'm going to think, okay, what two numbers multiply to make 16 but add to make negative 10? So those two numbers have to be negative so that they add to make a negative 10. So I've got, you can list these off to the side if you need to. I can do negative 4 times negative 4. That adds to negative 8, so that's not going to work. I could do negative 2 times negative 8. That'll work. Those two add up to negative 10. So I'm just going to put those two numbers in my parentheses after the x's. You can put them in either parentheses since they both have x. Now, each of these binomials, I'm going to split off into little mini equations. I'm going to set each of them equal to zero. And then I've got two little tiny equations to solve. The one on the left I'll solve by adding two to both sides. So x is positive two, there's one solution. On the right equation, I'm going to add eight to both sides to isolate my x x equals positive 8. So here are my two solutions. Alright, this is our last example. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, this equation, this quadratic, has an x squared term and an x term, so just like last time, we're going to set everything equal to 0. Oh, already done. Um, because we don't have a trinomial, we're not going to factor into two binomials. What we're going to do is we're going to look at every term, and we're going to factor out the greatest common factor. In this case, both terms have at least 1x. The first term has 2x's, because remember, x squared is the same as x times x. So we're going to pull an x out of both of them, and we're going to put what's left over in parentheses. If I, and remember, this is kind of the opposite of distributing, so I'm trying to think x times what will give me x squared? Well, that's x. x times what gives me 5x? Well, that's 5. And I can check to see if I did it correctly by distributing it, distributing it back in and seeing if I get what I started. So now, just like before, I've got something times something. And I'm going to set each of those somethings equal to 0, just like we did with the binomials. So I'm going to set x equal to 0. Oh, look, that equation's already solved. So there's one solution. And then we're going to set the x plus 5 equal to 0. To solve that, I simply have to subtract 5 from both sides. x equals negative 5. Whoops. Here's my other solution. And then you may have to do another step to evaluate it, but these are your two solutions. Um, don't ever eliminate um, a solution because it's negative. There's nothing wrong with negative numbers. Um, sometimes when you plug in a negative, you'll get a negative value, and then you you don't want that, especially if that value represents an angle measure or a side length or a distance. But there's nothing wrong with a negative solution. Okay, so you're going to use these examples to help you do 9.1 numbers 1 through 12. You must, must feel good about all of these in order to do well with this chapter. This is our last chapter we'll probably complete, and it's probably one of the most important chapters as far as taking it along with you to later math courses. So good luck and write down any questions you have. Love you a lot.